Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Andy Rich, and he is the Director of Water Policy for the Alberta Department of Environment and Sustainable Resource Development. And he leads a team that's dedicated to developing integrated policy approaches for achieving provincial water management objectives. Prior to water, Andy worked on provincial and national climate change policy, including a leading role in the development of Alberta's current climate change plan and associated legislation.
of the oil and gas uh, sector and other natural resource sectors that start to spawn this conversation that's a little different than perhaps other parts of, of the world. <clears throat> and so we do uh, and have continued to admire, I guess, as a province that we're growing, we're growing in population, we're growing in, 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 in various industrial and economic activities. It's something that's a, as much, I guess, a part of human nature. And so the challenge that it brings in is about specific industries. Uh, but we also know that, uh, that there's a recognition, I guess, that there are limits, and, and uh, what you're going to be seeing, what we'll talk about a little later, is what we're trying to figure out is how do we begin to talk about some of those limits without scaring people, industry, consumers, citizens, etc., but to acknowledge those limits. And one of the ways that this kind of manifesting itself is this concept of social license. It's currently more applied to industry than anything, but I think it could apply to when we get in our cars to drive and we buy products when, uh, when uh, pulp and paper goes to producing. There's this, this confluence of different competing interests that for a province I think we would find we haven't had to have some of these fights, but now we have an agenda and a, and a, and a premier and a government that has an agenda that begins to look at the interface of all of these and begins to challenge how they do fit together and challenging the current system of how we regulate to say, is it working? And so we have uh, you know, social interests and the quality of life that we can see based on uh, some of the, the commentary and experiences today. There are challenges to quality of your life and our ability to enjoy what we've enjoyed, been able to enjoy the past. Uh, energy is a part of our uh, economy, it's a part of our makeup and our history. Uh, it's not just about fossil fuels, there's other sources of energy, but it is a part of, of, of our history and it'll be a part of our, our future for at least the foreseeable uh, future. And the economy is, is, is something that uh, we've been fortunate, I guess, within, within uh, Western Canada to not have to perhaps have the same uh, challenges that other parts of, of the world have had. But right now we do have a link of uh, or a need to address some of the fiscal challenges, not only today and appreciating the role of, of, of being a resource-based economy in that regard, but some of the challenges with the infrastructure and other legacy challenges we have into the future and how we fund that and how we can't necessarily rely solely on a resource-based economy to do that. And that requires some tough conversations, and that's why you'll see uh, a variety of conversations, sort of the buzzword of the day, but a conversation on a variety of fronts uh, by this government. We'll try and get out there talking about these different things and getting some ideas on the table. And then, of course, we have the environment and, and appreciation and desire for a lower footprint to respect uh, for transparency, trust, credibility throughout that's emerging, I think, quite significantly. But what we've, uh, I think, admired is, is, is province is the need to highlight the direction we need to go in environmental management. So we think of a water for life in 2002 where citizens got together and said we need to respect water uh, more appropriately, more effectively. We need to balance economic, environmental, social interests. But we didn't really get into the details of what would that mean, what types of decisions may need to be required uh, to, to enable that. We've also uh, uh, seen a, a move in, in more language focused on transparency and credibility. Again, perhaps uh, you can think about what are the motivators, is it political or otherwise. Uh, from our perspective, from a, from a policy development and advice perspective, we're taking that as, as operating principles and operating guidance to challenge how we're currently regulating, how we're currently collecting information to make sure that we are putting information out, perhaps that we've historically collected or or, or not in a way that is meaningful and it's useful, it's not just down the years of paper on people. That what we do collect is credible, so we're collecting the right things uh, and, and providing it in the right way and using independent systems where appropriate, where necessary. And uh, we heard earlier, I think we're still going to grow in that regard, but at least we have to put down the paper and, and identify the direction we need to head and be challenged uh, against that. And that's where some of the monitoring agency directions of the single regulated directions intended to go. And of course, relevance. And, and the solution to much of this is not just collecting more information of the city, it's to make sure we have the right data and ensure that it is being collected in not only an independent way, but in a way that actually is meaningful and gives us results. We can collect, for example, more information on fractured fluid, and we can release it to the public, and that's a direction that we're going. But what does that mean? That doesn't say anything about the need to move away from, from uh, toxins or non toxic chemicals. It doesn't say anything about the need to uh, think better about what types of uh, non-water alternative technologies might, uh, might be considered. So we have to think not only just about the information we collect, but uh, the need to collect it. Cumulative effects is, is sort of the, the mantra and the appreciation that uh, each individual activity, we, we have some form of regulatory regime, and, and it, it could be seen as good, bad, or otherwise. But the challenge we have not only in the landscape of competing uses, uh, but also competing or, or, or uh, interacting uh, regularly 
regulatory requirements, whether it's for the oil and gas sector or for agriculture or for municipalities. We need to ensure that the uh, whole is girded in some of the parts. And so we're trying to think about different ways in which we can actually regulate on the landscape, not solely as the government uh, uh, talking about through command and control, thou shalt not change your requirements from, from here to there, but engaging through a uh, process uh, a means by which we're not only uh, identifying some of the channels on the landscape in a more comprehensive way, but also looking to the future and asking citizens from an economic, environmental, and social perspective, what do we want to see our communities look like? What types of activity do we want to see? Maybe there will need to be a conversation on trade-off to say agriculture may not be as prevalent, it may be energy or reciprocally, maybe we don't need energy, we'd like to maintain and, and have an enhancement in agriculture wherever the direction may be. And that's the purpose of the land use framework and the legislation that guides that and the planning that's going on around the land use framework. We've uh, released and approved a, a, a Lower Athabasca Regional Plan that is a starting point of this concept of, of, of actually translating the concept of cumulative effects into actual management. But what's critical in, in, in many of these, other than the conversation getting citizens to be part of it and describing what they want to see and are willing to tolerate on the landscape, is identification of of limits and in having an honest and scientific informed discussion about where are the points at which the amount of air uh, capacity is now eroded to the point the system is shut down, where is the, the maximum uh, allowable load of, of, of some form of uh, release into water or access to water. We're fortunate that we have surpassed a lot of those thresholds within the province, but I think we can equally acknowledge that, that we're heading in that direction based on the current interest in growth and development. So what these management frameworks do, which are nested within these regional plans, begin to define those limits to say we can't go past those, but equally important set of place triggers to say how do we begin to monitor and measure and identify triggers that say we may be creeping towards those limits and in some form of response, not just by an individual operator, but by a collective uh, management response that could be one sector or multiple sectors, including industry, need to respond in a way that to, to turn that uh, trend around away from those thresholds. And so we've had this conceptual uh, idea of this land use framework. We, we've carved the province into seven regions. Uh, we've talked uh, through the Lower Athabasca Regional Plan about getting people together and we're going to do it in the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan that that phase, that next phase has been initiated. But ultimately, they're, they're driving towards some guide or improved guide for decision making. And so what, uh, what this just uh, demonstrates is, is an example of the water quality uh, management framework. Again, it's the lower out the basket, but it's beginning to get real numbers uh, and they'll continuously improve with better monitoring, better science. But the thing I've, I've circled or highlighted is it's, it's also beginning to articulate management intent. It's beginning to say within a certain region, we want to see an improvement in the environmental quality or we want to maintain what we have or there could be circumstances where it's a, it's a community, it's a region, say it's okay to accept some level of deterioration. There's no, no decision or impact that any of us make industry or otherwise. It's not going to have a, a negative impact on the environment. It's the degree of that impact that we're dealing with here. And, and sometimes there's things that we can not do or avoid to make a positive impact. But this is saying that we have to have that conversation looking into the future, at regional level, not just with the government or industry, but community based. That's, that's open, that's transparent, that says this is what we want our region to look like into the future. We also know that, that uh, we have a regulatory framework and, and uh, you know, I think you can look to any particular uh, box in there and say, you know what, I have an experience where this didn't work effectively or had not worked effectively, but it is important to recognize again, when we think about what types of enhancements or changes are needed, there is a starting point in a regulatory framework. And, and, and again, just another slide that shows there's, there's no shortage of rules. The question is, A, are we fully enforcing all those rules in all instances, and B, are they the right rules? Are they the rules that we, that uh, perhaps are, are, are they the rules that will guide and, and most effectively manage the type of development we're seeing on the landscape? I think what we've acknowledged is, uh, from, again, from policy advice from a regulatory perspective, is the type of development we're seeing on the landscape. Uh, we've seen it with respect to oil sands. Uh, we, we've seen it to some extent with but certainly we're anticipating and, and actually seeing in certain areas with unconventional oil and gas that our regulatory systems that we currently have, despite the, the, the multitude of, of decades of experience, 
are not sufficient to most effectively manage the footprint and, and the impact that we're expecting to see with uh, the advent of unconventional oil and gas uh, development that's been uh, basically enabled through some uh, technology step changes in uh, multi-stage economic fracture. And part of it is, uh, you know, with respect to the oil sands, the ability to move on the lower Athabasca regional plant. It's a set sector, it's a discrete area. There is a, a significant monitoring that has been going on. Again, has it been uh, the, always the right monitor, the right amount? I think we can, we can debate that there are some shortfalls, and, and that's why we're moving to, to improve in that regard. But at least there's, there, there is a starting point, a baseline, for, perhaps, from which we could assess. When we think about unconventional oil and gas and where it's happening, we may not be uh, as fortunate to have some of that, uh, that, that knowledge, that, that science. Similarly, there's multiple players, large companies, small companies, uh, different sized communities. And of course, the range of impacts are varying. It's not just the water issue, even though water is one of the most significant issues, but it's noise, it's traffic, it's other factors that are affecting quality of life that need to be effectively managed. And so I think we've, uh, together, we've acknowledged that there's a range of impacts from water to uh, dis the different types of disturbance above and below ground, but ultimately a part of this the intensity of the activity, and that's really what's challenging people. Maybe one or two wells in an area are natural, when you have 16 or 18 wells, we might have a problem. The impact, the physical impact, and risks may not be any different, but the regulatory regime as we currently know it may not be able to effectively handle that and give sure and confidence to the public that the public is in, in that area, and we're hearing that loud and clear. And so we know that there needs to be management response, and it has to be guided in the context of what we've talked about around different ways of approaching regulatory uh, and, and over, uh, approval and oversight. The land use planning framework is going to give a guide, hopefully, to the expectations of these types of activities in the area. But we also know that when we think about specifically hydraulic fracture and unconventional oil and gas, there may be some different approaches that we need to consider moving away from the one-off authorization, for example, to more of a play-based, uh, cumulative effects-based uh, model that looks at all of the actors within a particular area, ensuring that there's, there's room, space, capacity for all of those current and planned actors, and then the management of those actors and how they manage water, how they manage drilling, uh, uh, disturbance on the landscape is done in a more collaborative way, where there still may be impact and then there will be impact but the degree and the significance is, is far lower. So we are taking uh, 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 action in a variety of areas, and so I'd say uh, part of the purpose of these types of conversations is to confirm that we are taking the right amount of action, or at least uh, focusing in the right areas, that we, uh, uh, we have identified, and certainly with respect to unconventional oil and gas, a need to move on this more collaborative, cumulative uh, effects-based model, and so the Energy and Resources Conservation Board is moving forward on what they're calling the Unconventional Regulatory Framework, and so you'll be hearing more about that in the coming months and have an opportunity to provide input into that. Uh, we're looking to uh, the current oil field injection policy that uh, we heard about earlier, uh, about how we guide water use in the oil and gas sector to, to consider expanding that to all operations in, the, in that sector. Uh, we've heard loud and clear about the need to improve the baseline water well testing, not for the sake of doing it, but for the sake of making sure that we are helping to add assurance. And so there may be other testing and other procedures that we need to, uh, to look at. And then we talk about the levels and the other avenues. I'll point to, or just note, uh, again, the, the interest in getting uh, more information out in a, in a more effective and, and, and open and transparent manner. One of the models that uh, we see that we need to build from for unconventional oil and gas is what we've done for the, uh, the oil sand sector, where you can go online uh, in the geospatial where you can click on a particular uh, monitoring site or operators to know what are the limits for air and water, what are their current uh, releases. So it's a starting point to begin to uh, put information out in a in more open and transparent manner. And we think this has to apply to uh, a range of other activities. <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, final uh, uh, element that I, that I want to touch on is our minister is committed to engaging citizens in a water conversation. Uh, and that is uh, as much to begin to uh, confirm and test priorities and, and, and where those risk areas or concerns or concern areas are for citizens as it is about helping to provide a, a first step towards uh, having some, what I'd say, tough discussions among government and among citizens, but the move to make some of the changes that have been explored and, and perhaps admired over the past few years. And so it's not to reset and, and, and come up with a new list of issues are, 
but it's to build a foundation uh, among the average Albertan of an appreciation of what are some of the pressures. It's uh, taking the water for life principles as a basis to say if we truly want to think uh, into the future and appreciate water, what are some of the risks, challenges, and policy decisions we may need to make to, uh, to, to, to realize those objectives. And so what we've committed is uh, starting, uh, the Minister has indicated hopefully in the new year, is to begin to go out and engage Albertans in areas again that we think are, are, are of, of high risk or concern, of areas that touch on all citizens in some way, but equally important that do require some, some honest conversation because if we think about some of the areas that we've been hearing about water management, not just in southern Alberta, but also in, in, in better use of water use in northern Alberta with the well sense, hydraulic fracturing, obvious issues certainly with water, uh, the importance of making sure that we value and take full advantage and can, can enjoy lakes across the province, and then the sustainability of our drinking water, wastewater, the infrastructure, the appropriate costing associated with that. The actions that may be required to deal with some of those challenges require behavior change, legislative change, uh, economic uh, shifts too, and it's not just the industry, it could be all of us in this room thinking about different ways in which we support and are able to fight some of the system. And so what this government wants to do is to enable through the right amount of information uh, a conversation on these priorities and then confirm that there's an acceptance and appreciation to begin to move on in the coming years where many of them still have a bit of time, thank goodness, and others we, we perhaps uh, are operating a bit in the rear view and we have to, we have to catch up. Uh, so stay tuned for more information on that. Uh, but I'd say that uh, that is a formal process we're starting, but in the interim, we are, to the extent possible, participating in these types of forums. This is an opportunity for us as much to convey uh, the direction we're trying to head and where the government's trying to head on water as it is to uh, listen and uh, appreciate that we've got the right priorities and we're taking the right approach. And at least that we're saying the right things. And I realize that the devil may have the details and, and, and this government is going to be held accountable to real results. And so this is still just maybe the safer conversation, setting up the dialogue. We're hearing that the sense of optimism of that really happening is maybe not at an all-time high, uh, but hopefully it's, uh, it's not also at the all-time low. But uh, I'll stop there, and uh, again, once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, convey some of the thoughts of the government on water issues. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Thank you, Mr. As this conference has progressed, I'm, I'm recognizing that perhaps we've had uh, a three or four day conference in the span of uh, less than 16 hours. So, uh, thank you for your attention. We've received a lot uh, and have been attentive. And just before we take a little bit of a break, I'd like be the opportunity to switch gears and to consider that as a community uh, we've come from many places and we've done a lot of listening and we've received a lot and hopefully we haven't been overwhelmed in life and we get our collective we have a large enough container for what we've heard and one of the main purposes of this conference has been to listen uh, and to respond from a deeper place that is about a vision that maybe we haven't seen or don't see yet. And that vision comes from a collective depth of community about what we wish for our community. So as we let all the information coalesce, as we take a breath to kind of relax the attentiveness that we've held, uh, the next portion of our program involves, okay, we've heard a lot, we've received a lot, what is now our vision? Because the future has not yet been written. And we can suggest that others make changes. 
but it, it is in our capacity to, to create the future we wish for. And that, at its heart, uh, was our students' idea that we are writing the future, and it's not just up to the young generation, it's all of us together. And I believe we all feel in our hearts we can do amazing, amazing things. So uh, our final presenters will uh, give us sort of insights into that vision. We're lucky to draw upon the ancient past of uh, the First Nations people of this land, and also a local farmer who is tending to the land. <coughs> so I, we had hoped to uh, engage the panelists further, but I think given our time and, and wanting to make you, allow you to go home, uh, obviously you're free to leave whenever you would like, <laughs> but on time. Uh, what I'd like to suggest is that we take a little bit of a break, uh, grab some tea and coffee, uh, relax a little, um, and then uh, when you come back to enter into this mode of imagination and vision and allow that to inform how we shift into this stepping out of this place and not burdened necessarily by the overwhelming of information, but awakened and inspired that we can, together, as your presence and attention here indicates, create a caring future that uh, is worthy of the immense resources that we've been given. Okay, so uh, one last thing um, is when you come back, uh, we'll have a piece of paper on the table for each one of you just to write down your comments about how we went highlights, um, and then um, maybe take some time to share here where everybody's from. And maybe as we start to get up, maybe we can just do that. Uh, so I know folks are from down south as far as Lethbridge. Um, yeah, one, two, three, four, five. And uh, two arms there. And so folks from Calgary, I know. Quite a bunch, actually. Uh, and we've got Rosebud, so a little closer. Yeah, over there. Hudson's. And where else? Where else are you? Stetler. Stetler, yeah. Okay. Lacombe. Lacombe.